Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to the QTEC 360. Uh, people from home, um, if you have questions, just unmute yourself and speak up, we can hear you. So today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Guido van der Stolpe. Guido is a PhD student at Aminiao Lab. Uh, he has a master from Leiden University, quantum uh, matter and quantum and optics uh, with a specialist sorry i have to do this again <laughs> Guido has actually a master in uh, um, experimental physics with a specialization in quantum matter and optics and now he works on material defect spin system uh, with application in quantum sensing and networks Guido thank you Garcia for the introduction <laughs> um hello everyone um, today, um, I'll give a seminar on uh, our recent work in our group, which is about uh, mapping 50 spin qubit uh, quantum simulator. Okay, um, if you have any questions during the talk, don't hesitate to raise your hand. I want to make it interactive, so uh, uh, feel free to speak up. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, I want to uh, start with this quote from Richard Feynman, um, which basically states that if you want to simulate uh, quantum mechanical systems, um, that is not a classical system, so you better use a quantum mechanical computer, um, so a, qu a quantum computer. Um, and this is actually the first mention of using uh, quantum systems to simulate other systems. And this was back in uh, 1981. Um, the clicker is not sorry. So this was back in uh, 1981. Uh, so it's already 40 years ago, and uh, it took this long before the first quantum simulators are actually popping up now. So this is some work from uh, our group that you see here, um, which uh, was the first one of the first um, uh, quantum simulators uh, that was built. And we managed to uh, create a new phase of matter uh, and, and show this in the lab that this can be attained. Um, so, uh, what is actually a quantum simulator and why would it be useful? So, the idea about, uh, behind quantum simulation is that if you have a very difficult many-body uh, physics problem, such as uh, mold insulation or maybe high uh, temperature superconductivity, um, then it might be useful to have an other quantum system that you control and know very well and sim sim mimic this Hamiltonian of this very complicated system that you want to learn about on this uh, other system. Um, and then um, you can kind of simulate what that system uh, would do. Um, an interesting thing about quantum simulators in, in, in comparison to quantum computers is that it's kind of NISC era proof. So NISC era is when we still have like noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum devices. Um, so a quantum simulator, the, the fidelities don't have to be like 100%. Um, you can have, you don't need error correction. You can do already some very useful stuff when your qubits are still not perfect yet. And that's why we believe that in the, in the coming years, this is still an area where you can make some serious results. Okay. Um, I was talking about this exponential scale up, of course, um, and we're all quantum physicists here working on the quantum computer, so we have a good feeling for exponential growth, I guess. Um, so that's why I want to you guys to, to, to ask this question um, about uh, the power of exponential law, um, and which basically, if I have a, a piece of paper and I fold that paper over and over and over. Um, how many times do you have to fold that paper before the stack of paper becomes so thick that it actually reaches to the moon? So these are uh, four answers and I have actually a, a Slido um, where you can scan the QR code and you guys can, uh, oh, wow. can tell us what you think. So grab out your phones and... Uh, okay. What is the thickness of the original paper? <laughs> <laughs> That's spoiling the question. No. <laughs> And the day four. Okay, I think we can share. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Almost all. Okay. I think we can show the first poll. Okay, so we see some uh, different answers. Very nice. 1405, someone uh, uh, answered. I think that's kind of like uh, close to the limit of the universe already. Um, so uh, actually the right answer is indeed uh, 41. Um, so 
So uh, most of you are right. So uh, you passed this test. Um, and I think it's still quite amazing that only 40 of these faults uh, you already get to the moon. Um, so that, that gives you really uh, insight in the exponential power uh, of these quantum simulators. And in that context, I also want to present like the main result of this work, which is that we had a quantum simulator um, where we had access to 27 of these qubits. And this work really focused on extending this number to 50 qubits. And on the y-axis here, I plot the Hilbert space size, which is a measure for the complexity this quantum simulator can access. And you can really see that you can have like these orders of magnitude increase. Every qubit doubles the Hilbert space. So um, yeah, that's kind of the relevance of it. Then um, I want to explain to you guys how we get to these 50 qubits. And for that, I have these four topics in my work, um, the nuclear spins and diamond, um, how we map a spin network, why we even want to do that, um, the techniques we developed for that to, to be able to, to map it, and then reconstructing this 50 spin network uh, and giving a, a small outlook on how we want to use it for quantum simulation. So first about uh, nuclear spins and diamonds. Um, so we study nuclear spins and diamonds, um, and we do this uh, on nuclear spins that surround uh, an MV center, a nitrogen vacancy center. And for those of you who don't know what nitrogen vacancy center is, Nitrogen vacancy center is a, um, a defect in a in crystal lattice in diamond crystal lattice. So if you have a diamond lattice, it's it's made up out of carbon atoms, and it can be that two of them are missing, and then one gets occupied by a nitrogen atom, and the other one is vacant. And then an electron can get trapped in that vacancy, and that uh, is the MV center. And we can actually access that electron um, via uh, microwaves. We can control its spin state, and it has an optical interface. So we can control that uh, that MV center. Um, that's quite abstract, so how does that actually look in the lab? So if we look in the lab, we see here our PCB um, inside our cryostat, that thing that you see around it. And if you look in the middle of this PCB, um, you see this tiny diamond, which is only two by two millimeters, so very tiny. And if we zoom, on, zoom in even more on this, you will see these kind of weird uh, structures. So um, this stuff around uh, is the diamond, and we kind of curve these little balls in the diamond. We, we, um, we fabricate these little uh, balls in the diamond, which are acting like lenses to get as much photons from this MV center out as possible. Um, so inside that uh, hole, there's, a, there's an MV center. Um, and we also have this RF line that's next to, the, uh, to this MV center so we can send microwave pulses. Um, so if we now put a laser and we scan over this, this lens-like uh, thing, then we see in the middle actually that very bright dot. And that's our MV center. And that's our link to the nuclear spins that are surrounding there. Because we cannot access the nuclear spin directly, we need this MV center as our gateway to access these nuclear spins, which we want to use for uh, quantum computation. So about these nuclear spins, what do they look like? Um, uh, if you look inside uh, a diamond lattice, then most of the, uh, uh, we actually use the, 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 the atoms that make up the diamond lattice. And most of these are carbon-12 isotope, and they don't have spin, so we cannot really use them as qubits. But about 1% is actually carbon-13 isotope. Let's spin half particle. Um, but they are like randomly scattered to the, to the lattice, so we don't know where they are uh, at all. Um, so what we actually did a few years ago is to image um, the nuclear spins which are closest around this MV center, uh, 27 of them. And that you see in this uh, video of this plastic model, where these white balls actually uh, these white balls actually uh, are the carbon-12 isotope atoms, and these yellow balls are the carbon-13 atoms, which are spin-half particles, which we are using as our qubits for our quantum simulator. Um, and if you look in the center there, you see this uh, green and purple ball, that's the location of our MV center in this lattice. So for these 27 spins, we were able to actually position where these um, qubits are up to the lattice uh, uh, resolution. Um, so yeah, these are our qubits, and this is what we want to use for, um, for our quantum simulation. OK, so um, we have uh, another question about this uh, sample where we actually map these uh, 27 qubits. And the question is, um, we take out our sample out of the setup typically every 5 to 10 days, weeks, months, or years. <laughs> People are being influenced by each other, I think. Which is hiding in the hills. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
Okay, everyone picked an answer. Yeah, so in general, you guys got it correct. Um, it's indeed years. So this, this sample hasn't been out of the price that for like six years or so now. Um, so it's really quite amazing that you can have such a sample and you can just do measurements on it for five to 10 years and never have to take it out. And also it's very important for us because if you want to map all these uh, nuclear spins around them, around the MV center, and even go to 50 spins, then you need your sample to be super stable because you invest a lot of time in really getting to know that sample and you don't want it crashing after a month and you have to start over again. And so that's, that's, I think, really cool that we have such a robust environment that we can study. Um, okay, so a bit more about these uh, uh, nuclear spins then, because we want to use them as a quantum simulator, but are they any good? Um, so to use them as in quantum simulation, we need to be able to do these three things, initialization, control, and readout of the spins. Um, so for initialization, we use um, uh, a protocol where we actually polarize the MV center uh, with light, and then we let that uh, polarization diffuse into the carbon network. So they will get the polarization from the MV center. And in this way, we can initialize the carbon spins to be up at the start of our experiment. This doesn't work for all carbon spins just as well, but we can have some degree of polarization in there. Then for the control, we want to, to, to be able to uh, control them. We can do that with, directly with RF pulses and we have typical fidelities of 99%. So that's, that's not really a problem for us. Um, and then in the end, we want to, of course, read out the, the final spin states of this uh, carbon spins. And for that, we can read out directly about 10 carbon spins with fidelities ranging from 70 to 95%, uh, also a bit depending on the specific spin. So these are not great numbers for quantum computation, but remember, we're thinking about quantum simulation where we don't need 99.9% .9 fidelities per se. Um, so we're happy that we can at least get something out. Um, and then, of course, another important number of these qubits um, is, are, are they coherent enough? Can we actually do that preserved coherence well enough uh, for actually to, to compute or to simulate certain things? So for this, we have two uh, important time scales. First is the uh, Ramsey, uh, or the, uh, it's a T2 star time scale, which we measure with the Ramsey experiment that we do here. So we put a, a nuclear spin up, we give it a pi over two pulse, we let it process, and it will decay at the typical time scale, uh, what you call T2 star. And this is given by uh, quasi-static noise in the environment. So every time I do my experiment, my environment, spin environment looks a bit different. So it feels a bit different magnetic field. So it will, have, uh, it will decay a bit. Um, we can count, we can extend this coherence time by applying a spin echo. And I want to explain this because it's important for all the sequences we do later. Um, so spin echo, what we do is we do the same thing as this Ramsey experiment with the, where we let the uh, nuclear spin oscillate. But now we add, um, a pi pulse here in the middle. And we make sure that, this, that the, the time spacing along that time pulse is exactly half-half. And what happens then is that if the nuclear spin picks up some phase in the first half, we do the pi pulse and it will pick up the same uh, phase in the second half and exactly cancel out. So if we uh, show it on the block sphere, you see here that the nuclear spin picks up the phase, we apply the pi pulse, we flip to the other side and it will pick up the same phase again and return exactly where it started. So if you now plot this, we'll see just a, a flat line at, at where, where the nuclear spin starts. So this lets us extend the coherence of the nuclear spin. And now is the question um, that you guys can answer. What is actually the T2 coherence of the nuclear spin if we do this? If we do this trick with the spin echo, we let it go back. How much time can we let it go before it doesn't come back anymore, before it kind of lost its coherence? And the, the answer are five microseconds, 100 microseconds, 10 milliseconds, or a second. I need the results this time. <laughs> okay. I think everyone put in their answers. Yeah, one second. Uh, again, uh, all right. I think uh, <laughs> that's very impressive. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if we quickly go back to the presentation. Yeah. So indeed, um, if we do this spin echo trick on our nuclear spin qubits, we'll actually see coherence times of one second if we do a spin echo. And if we add more of these refocusing pulses, we can extend it even more up to 12 seconds. So I said, it's the time I take presenting a slide, that spin will still be just coherent there. So that's, I think, very, very impressive. Um, so from that point of view, I think, 
This is a quite a cool system to do quantum simulations on. We have some rudimentary control readout initialization, and we have really good coherence. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's about one millisecond. Um, but that's mainly because we're limited by heating in our system. Uh, you can, uh, if you put in more power, you can do it much faster. Um, yeah, typically uh, about one millisecond in our experiments. Yeah, kilohertz, Abi. Um, okay. Then uh, what has been done before with this system? With the, if you have these nuclear spin qubits, you have a few of them. What what can you do? So I already told you that we made this uh, discrete time crystal in our group. Um, so for that. Um, my collaborators, they picked nine of these uh, nuclear spins and uh, did a quantum simulation on that. And the quantum simulation looks a bit uh, like this. Um, so you see these three steps. First, you have to initialize these spins. Um, you do this with this initialization sequence. And then uh, we do some RF pulses on them, um, which, which induce some interesting dynamics. And then we have to read out all of those spins. Um, so that's the, the, the three blocks that we have to do. And, and for these nine spins, that worked uh, quite okay. Um, but of course, if you want to nine spins, you can still quite easily simulate on a classical computer. So you want to go to more complex systems, namely 50 spins. Um, so how do you get there? Uh, it turns out that's a bit more difficult. If you look at what the literature is doing on, on this subject, is that it, there are little groups who can push beyond like the 20 uh, limit. So there's some very nice work from the Degen group uh, who positioned also 20 to 29 spins. Our group uh, had 27 spins, actually uh, up to atomic resolution. And there's also this nice work that was a col collaboration uh, between us um, and a group in uh, South Korea, where they actually we actually can uh, detect 30 spins uh, with the help of machine learning, uh, which I think is very cool. Um, but all of these methods kind of uh, get stuck around 25 to 30 spins. Um, and that's really because uh, the more spins you want to add, it becomes harder to really see which spin is which, and uh, it becomes just messy business. Okay, um, so how do we do it then? Um, so we uh, want to map uh, a spin network. Um, and first I want to explain you why we, what we mean with mapping a spin network and, and, and why we do that. Um, so with network mapping, I mean, I want to fill in the Hamiltonian parameters that describe this network. I want to know for every spin, uh, what its spin frequency is and how it couples to other spins. Um, so here you see a schematic um, of, the, uh, of how the system looks. So you have this electron spin in the middle, and then you have these nuclear spins, which are the gradles uh, are around them. And these nuclear spins have a hyperfine interaction with the, uh, with the electron spin, which gives them a bit of a frequency shift. If this nuclear spin is very close to the electron, it will give a, uh, give a, get a big uh, frequency shift and it will change its frequency a lot. If it's further away, it will not change a lot. Um, so that I try to um, note here with these, these colors, these A1 to A5 mean different frequencies of, at which the, the nuclear spins uh, process. So to map the Hamiltonian, we need to get these frequencies. And also we need to uh, get the couplings between the nuclear spins. Nuclear spins are also just little magnets. And if they're close together, they will have a stronger interaction. If they're farther apart, then they will have a weaker interaction. So to really know all about the system, we have to know the interaction between the spins and also interaction with the electron. So that's that Hamiltonian, and we want to map that for 50 spins. Um, in this work, we basically develop two methods to, to get to 50 spins. One is we uh, find a way to uh, make change, uh, to measure change of spins all the way deep into the network to also access these spins back there, that, which couldn't be accessed be before. And the other one is that we actually increase the spectral resolution with which we measure these spin frequencies. That you can visualize a bit like these frequency bands just become much more narrow and we can much more precisely determine what is the frequency, this A of a certain nuclear spin. Okay, so first uh, the workhorse, how we, how, we, uh, how we measure these nuclear nuclear uh, interactions is with the spin echo double resonance. So here you see um, basically two spins um, spin one and spin two. And first we perform a spin echo uh, on spin one, which we did before. And you would expect that it would just go back to where it was. But what we do now is that we have this second spin and at that frequency, we also insert a pi pulse. And if you do that, then you actually couple back in that spin, uh, 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 couple back in that spin. So with the spin echo, where we're decoupling uh, the first spin from the rest of the environment, but now we recouple in the other spin. So they're both feeling each other again. 
And this way we get this oscillation and this oscillation actually is exactly the, the coupling between the spin, which you call C1 here. And we abbreviate this block as, as C because this measures the coupling between the spin at A1 and the spin at A2. So in this way, we can really get the coupling between two frequencies. Um, so if we do that in, in this system, what we see if we can, we can, for example, first put frequency A1 and A2, um, and then we see this, uh, this frequency. So this is uh, just a measurement of the coupling between A1 and A2. Um, what we can then do is sweep this frequency A2 here, um, and then we see this graph that you see below. Um, so you see this dip where we're just at at A2, that is actually the spin um, uh, that we were measuring the coupling before to, this one. And now if we change the frequency, we see this other dip at another frequency. So that's another uh, spin we can uh, see, see it, uh, there, and that's spin A3 at A3. So in this way, we can really map out the coupling be between A1 and A2, and then between A1 and A3. And this way, we can measure all the couplings in that nuclear network. Um, so the information we get here is basically we have a spin at A1 and a spin at A2, and they couple with a certain coupling strength C1. Okay, um, so what is then the problem? Why can't we go past 25 spins? Thing is that if you go for spins that are farther away from the electron spin, they will all feel more or less the same shift from the electron, so they will also have the same frequency. So they will start to overlap in, spectra, in, in frequency space. And as you can see here, so if I do, for example, now a setter between these frequencies A2 and A3, you see that there are actually two spins at A3. There's this one here, but there's also that one. And if you now measure a certain coupling, you never know if it was to that spin or to that spin. And that's a problem because then you, you have measured some parameter, but you don't know where to put it in the Hamiltonian and you cannot solve the network anymore. You always have to know between which spins am I measuring something. Um, yeah, so this cannot really be solved. And this already uh, happens quite a lot in our system here at Plot for a certain shift from the electron spin. How many spins would you expect at that frequency? And if you go into this regime, you already see like that you get 10 spins which have practically the same frequency. So you cannot just say, this is spin A because it has this, fre this frequency, this spin B because it has this frequency. Um, so that's why we need to increase the spectral resolution to still be able to identify different spins. So we do that by kind of shrinking these bands. So we have this technique where we actually see that this one spin has a slightly different frequency than that spin. And that's why uh, we can still identify it. Uh, so this is one thing. And the other thing we develop is to be able to make uh, long chains of spins to access these spins in the back. Because these spins in the back are very hard to access with the electron directly. But we can still access them with a, with a spin chain. Okay, so first about this uh, uh, high resolution spectroscopy. How do we do? Oh, by the way, are there any questions so far? Don't be shy. So far, so good. Okay. Um, also, yeah. Then first, uh, I want to tell you a bit about how we do this high uh, resolution, high uh, high resolution frequency uh, sensing. So. If we have this system, what we want to, uh, how do we normally measure actually the frequency of, of, of uh, which frequency we do? So what we do, we do this uh, setter that we uh, did before a couple of times, um, but now we sweep this uh, RF frequency again, um, and we see these different dips. And the width of this dip basically tells me uh, the frequency of this pin at A2, how much, how well uh, I can know this frequency. If this uh, frequency is very broad, it's very hard to uh, say exactly what the frequency it is. So if you zoom into one of these dips, you see that it's typically about 60 hertz to 100 hertz. Uh, that's for us still quite broad. Um, so if we want to improve that, um, we, uh, we developed a technique, and I won't go exactly into the details, but we actually add this, uh, this one block uh, before this sequence, and that actually encodes this higher resolution frequency. And if we apply that sequence, then we can bring this down to one and a half hertz. So we can now determine the, 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 the frequency of the spin at A2 with only one and a half hertz resolution, which is about a 40 times increase. So that really helps when we want to have spins that are almost at the same frequency, we can still identify them. So that solves one part of the problem. The other thing that, that it's hard to get further out in the network, we want to make uh, spin chains. So how do we do that? So spin chain, what we do is we take two of these setter blocks actually, um, and we just, Put them together in one experiment, and so now we're we're, we're doing this experiment with three RF frequencies, and we just have these 
two blocks in a single uh, sequence. Um, and that actually lets us uh, measure in one go this whole chain uh, from spin one to spin two to spin three. Um, and if we sweep these two times, uh, two, three, and one, two, we actually get the coupling C12 and C23. And this way we can access this spin uh, at A3 via this chain. And even if there are multiple spins around uh, in A3, only this spin is connected to this chain. So we can access it via this chain. So that also lets us circumvent this spectral crowding uh, in a sense. Um, okay, that's all theoretical. So how do we do what, what, what's the experiment we did to actually show that this is possible? Um, so what we do is we walk through these different frequency regions, and every time we add another of these uh, setter blocks. So at some points we're doing four frequencies, now we're doing actually five of these uh, frequencies. So we're really measuring a whole chain of five spins all the way deep into the network. Um, so if we look at the data, what we see, um, so here we just do the, the setter between uh, A1 and A2. Then we again uh, sweep the frequency. We add this uh, third um, frequency here, and we sweep that frequency. And that you can see that as if you're now looking from this pin at its local environment. So we're now sweeping this frequency, and we see these dips that correspond to spins that are coupled to this pin here. Um, and now we can zoom in on one of these dips, which I uh, colored purple here. Um, and I can measure the coupling between this blue spin and that purple spin. And that's what you see uh, down here, this oscillation. And now I can use that to actually use this one as a local sensor of its environment to go even deeper into the network, even further from the MV center. Um, and I again sweep at the ref frequency and I look at its environment. And then you see that you also see these dips everywhere. And if I then zoom into that specific peak, I can again measure the coupling to that spin. And I go on to the next spin, further and further out into the network. Um, and I can do that for a final one. And then you see that my oscillation is not so good anymore. So then uh, it kind of stops. So five is uh, what we can do. Uh, possibly is more, but uh, this is the state of the art right now. Um, so in this way, we can really map this whole chain, all the couplings between them, and access those spins, which are very far out. You do one question? Yeah. Is it always true that the oscillation on the spins more deep in your network uh, like are more dense? Yes, so the amplitude indeed, um, oh, my skills fell off here, um, but the amplitude will shrink um, if you have more, um, a longer chain. So if you want to measure with a spin that's the fourth spin in the chain, you will have to map that signal back through the chain to the electron spin, and that will decrease your amplitude in every step. So yeah, uh, it, will, it is harder and harder, so you amplitude them. And also what we see is that spins that are very far from the electron, their coherence also uh, deteriorates quite a bit. So we only we don't no, no longer get the second, but only 100 milliseconds. So that also makes it hard to sense anything uh, uh, really with those spins. So there's some kind of limit. I don't understand why the coherence time will be shorter for the spin that is further away from us. Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so. We use this spin echo to, to decouple a certain spin from the rest of the uh, environment. Um, we do that by applying a pulse at the frequency of that, that spin we're sensing with. But um, that's, that pulse has a certain pulse width, so it will also pulse some spins also at that frequency. If the spins, uh, if, if this, this spin we're sensing with couples strongly to other spins that are at the same frequency, we will not decouple it from those spins. So it will still have like a T2 star like. Uh, co uh, decoherence. So this this whole thing relies on the fact that if we have a certain spin, that we can decouple it somewhat from the rest of the spins it couples strongly to, and that lets us extend this coherence. So if you are, are looking at spins which are very far away from the MV center, the spins they couple to will also be very far away from the MV center, and they will have a similar frequency. So if I try to decouple them, I will also just couple all those spins in again. So it relies on the fact that we can selectively do pipes on one spin and not on the, its environment. And that breaks down at some point the further you go away. So if that makes sense. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, so we have these, we combine these two methods. So on the one hand to, to be able to identify spins by our super high resolution frequency. And on the other hand, to have the spin change to access more spins. Um, and now, um, 
we have all this data, all these chains with high resolution frequencies, and now we want to reconstruct that into an actual network uh, to get to fill all those Hamiltonian parameters. So how do we do that? One thing that's important there is that um, if we start measuring some of these chains, for example, this chain, um, and then we measure another chain, it might actually have a part that is the same. Um, and we need to be able to, to see that, that this is actually the same part here. So if we measure the frequencies of these spins very carefully, then we know that when we're working this way around, we're actually having the same part here. Um, so if we do that carefully, we can see that these parts are the same and we can actually say, oh, we have actually measured this structure. And that's important because otherwise you're just measuring chains that kind of branch out into uh, the depth all the time, but you cannot make cyclic networks anymore. So you need to be able to identify, okay, we're actually measuring the same piece. We just put them together and then we get this cyclic net network that is actually the real network. So this is one uh, thing we do. Second thing we do, um, which was actually uh, also done in this paper from 2019, is that we use these couplings, um, we put it in an algorithm and then it reconstructs um, the, the most likely spatial configuration of all these nuclear spins. Um, so here you see actually, uh, look at this scale bar, it's only like two nanometers, uh, but two by two nanometers. And you see these uh, 50 uh, spins in here uh, uh, where their most likely uh, position is. Um, for many of these spins, we really know them up to the left side. For others, we just know roughly where they are. Um, but we can use actually this uh, spatial configuration to calculate back what would be the couplings. So if it's, it's very hard, of course, to, for these 50 spins to measure every coupling between every spin. And it goes as n squared. Um, so it makes sense to kind of measure a limited number, then figure out where these spins are. And then from that configuration, calculate back what would be the couplings between all those spins. And then we can just fill in those Hamiltonian parameters without having to measure them explicitly. So that trick we play here. Um, and in that way, we can really get the 1,200 couplings between uh, all these spins, which are yeah too long to, to measure in, in the experiment. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the basic structure. We, we measure these long connected chains, we merge them together, and then we use this positioning algorithm to uh, calculate the couplings that we did not measure uh, explicitly. And uh, that gives you a picture that looks like this, where I plot all 50 spins, um, the color indicates their frequency, and I also plot uh, as links the, the coupling strength between these spins. So this is our 50 qubit uh, quantum simulator where we want to do experiments on. Um, and about those experiments. Uh, so first thing, of course, you'll need to do as a, uh, if you want to use it as a quantum simulator is to be able to initialize, control, and read out all these spins. Um, and this is the first attempt at that. Um, so what you see here is that for 48 of these 50 spins, um, we initialize the spin either up or we give the pi pulse to initialize it down, and then we read it out uh, again. Sometimes we read it out directly with the electrons. Sometimes we have to read it out via this long change in the network. And here I plot for these uh, spins, um, yeah, the contrast you see uh, in this readout, which is a kind of combined uh, initialization and readout for that. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. There's no optimization done here yet. Uh, you see some spins are, are, are not doing their job yet, um, but um, I think that with, with some work, uh, we'll, we'll make that work. Um, yeah, and the things you want to study on this system is uh, some uh, that will be done by Ben Cassina and Damian. Um, it will be, be about the limits uh, of how to initialize and read out these spins. Can we improve that? Um, things like how does entanglement spread in many body systems? Um, and also maybe you can create a 3D time crystal, uh, which some theorists say is impossible, uh, but will take up the challenge. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude. Um, so, I present you the work where we map this uh, network of 50 nuclear spins. Uh, for this, we develop these correlated uh, sensing schemes, and we want to use this, this, uh, this network as a, a many-body quantum simulator uh, in the near future. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, these people contributed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guido, for your presentation. Uh, let's see if there are questions here and also online. Yes. Start here. Yeah. Uh, you said it will take it long to measure all the couplings. I can imagine that. But uh, how long does it take you to measure one? Um, about 
Um, it depends on how far it's in the, in the chain, of course, but about order of magnitude half an hour, okay. uh, something like that for every coupling. Yeah. Um, so of course here we built on this work where you already have 27 and then we add uh, more, but it takes some time. And of course we hope that at some point we can kind of optimize this all. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, you said that a few of these couplings you basically guess based on what the distance is. Yeah. Can you check how good your guess is with later measuring? Yeah, so it's actually normally how we um, how we get the position. So what we do is we measure some coupling to a spin. We see some, we find a new spin. And then we think, okay, um, let's try to position that spin, which is that one coupling. So it will be some region. And then the algorithm will predict it to be very strongly coupled to another spin, for example. And then we think, okay, that's so easy to measure. And then we measure that coupling, we see it's not coupled at all. And then we kind of update our guess for where the spin should be. So typically, um, if we want to uh, position it with a reasonable accuracy, you need at least three couplings. Um, and, and for some of these spins, we have like 15 or so, and they're all match up. So then we were pretty sure that, uh, that they're in the good. Yeah. If there are any questions from the people online, they uh, can now unmute and uh, we can hear you. Or you can let them know in, in the chat, that's also fine. Yes, in the back. Before the next time, uh, so using this performance that you introduced what is the resolution of how precise can you measure the strings that you want? The 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 resolution on the coupling? Sorry? Yeah, so like the, the precision of your um method and like what is limit precision? Yeah so it's basically limited by the coherence time of that specific spin you use as a sensor. Um, so it's one over that coherence time. So if that coherence time gets like 10 milliseconds over like 100 milliseconds from these spins are far, then you can only measure couplings that are stronger than 10 hertz, let's say, or five hertz. Um, but for the spins that are, um, that, that are the nice spins that are a bit closer, you can measure um, under a hertz coupling, half a hertz coupling more or less. Um, and if you do a trick where you do multiple pulses, you can even get to uh, millihertz, I think. So you can really uh, push it quite far. Yeah. Uh, if then uh, cosmic ray would suddenly destroy your MV. Yeah. And you had to start over. How long would it take you to again map a cluster of uh, 50, 40, 30? Yeah, I think with the current, if the setup is still there, we don't have to build the setup from the cosmic ray. <laughs> uh, we'll save the but just a sample. Uh, I think with the current methods that we used here, um, I would say it takes at least half a year, maybe I think a year or less. Um, and that's that's really limiting. So I think if you can build a method that 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 can really quickly characterize these things, like they did with this machine learning algorithm, the, the first characterizations, that that would speed up hugely because you know where to look then. Yeah. One year PhD student. <laughs> Yes. If I understood correctly, for your coherence, you rely heavily on these echo pulses. Yeah. Does this limit the kind of experiments you can do with this kid exactly? Yeah. Um, um, yes. For the, for the quantum simulation, you mean? Yes. Yes, I think in the end, this, this will limit you. We're now not looking into like the experiments we're now proposing. Are actually um, let's say in the Z basis, so we don't mind the coherence of the of the spins so much. We want to see how the spins start to flip flop with each other and kind of diffuse polarization to the network. So there is not so important, but for something like the time crystal, um, that is important. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So then, yeah, the qubits become worse and worse the further you go out. Yeah, you actually notice the fusions between the atoms that your C9 CPU or C13 actually changes position. Um, no, 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 no. That that actually the, the positions change. No, no, we don't see that. No, it's an interesting question, but I, I I'm not sure. No, no we, we never saw that. Um, I think it's pretty stable. The system. I mean, for the at least not for the past ten years or so. <laughs> you haven't seen that. No. Would it be possible in the future to do something like this, but you have more electrons that you use? Yeah. As to your, like your starting points. 
Yeah, so this is also one of the directions we're investigating in our lab uh, with silicon carbide then, which is a similar thing, where you actually want to implant a multiple elect uh, defects close to each other. And then each of these defects have their own nuclear spins around them. And we want to implant these electrons so close that we can do the same kind of things with the electron spins. And then within each electron, you would have nuclear spins again. So yeah, this, this would be a way to scale up. Another thing which you could do, of course, is that these MVs provide an optical interface. So you could link them via entanglement, uh, remote entanglement. And then you have two uh, 50 qubit things that you can put together in, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, uh, could you, you said something about machine learning in the yeah. start. Was this for this or was it for something else? It was not for this project, but on this exact same sample, um, that was used basically not to get uh, the couplings of the spins, but just the spin frequencies. And it, it's a very complicated signal we can get for that where all the information is in there, but for a human, it's very difficult to interpret. And this machine learning algorithm uh, used pattern recognition to actually find all these parameters pretty quickly. So that will give you like a huge speed up because then you know, okay, at least I have these spins at these frequencies, and then I know what frequencies to use to get their couplings. Um, so yeah, and maybe some some parts of this will also be able to be op automated in the machine learning. Way. And they kind of like reproduced what you did, or like they found, yes. found the same pattern. Yeah, um, yeah, we kind of use our thing as a ground truth because we're pretty confident that it's uh, true. And they were pretty accurate. I think they, were, they did have some extra spins uh, that we did not see. And then the question is that some kind of weird peak in the data or um, was it actually a spin, new spin they found? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you said uh, that we or somewhere in your talk that uh, heating is the problem to, for a image or speed. Uh, how does heating for you manifest if, uh, that you get higher or that you, you cannot initialize to the ground state anymore or does uh, you get high chance? Yeah, so uh, the main problem we get with heating is that, um, so we have this strip line which is uh, on the diamond. Um, that is very nice because it's always in the same location, so it's very reproducible, but it also just heats the diamond. And the main problem is that the MV center, uh, the optical lines of the MV center, so we use a readout, a resonant readout, they start to shift. So if my sample heats too much, I won't get any photons from MV center. I think, okay, it was in the down state, but it actually just shifted. So if I put in too much energy, uh, this, this will, yeah, my MV center will break down now. So it's first, nuclear spins are still fine. So you could drive much harder as long as your MV center um, remain, remains cool. Yeah, it's really the readout. Yeah, that, that breaks down. Yes. As far as I understood, in a makeup property comes with a replacing technique. Does it also have the big flip errors? Um, I think it's a good question. I think not. Uh, no, don't have it on top of my head, but no, I think I think it's just for defacing. Yeah. Everyone online, uh, please feel free to uh, ask a question, uh, mute or use the chat. A lot of people online, so there should be some questions, right? If not, then no. Christina. Uh, do you plan to go even further? <laughs> Me personally, no. No, I, I've, I've had my fair share. Um, I think you can go further, and I think what you need is... Um, I think at some point you cannot play this trick again with uh, with spin echo because you're not decoupling and you're not extending the coherence anymore. And uh, what you need to do then is homonuclear decoupling, which you basically can decouple all the spins from each other, um, even if you're just driving the whole frequency band. Uh, so this is, this will be, I think, the next step. Uh, and then I think you can probably with the, also with these techniques alone, you can probably get to my, maybe seventy, and then you can probably get hundred. Maybe that would be a nice number for some future PC, I think. <laughs> A challenge, yeah. Any more questions? No? Okay. Then Guido, thank you very much yeah. uh, again for your presentation. Thank you and thank you to all of you for joining. I hope to see you in the next uh, Qtech 360 next year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.